Uh, Professor Frame, Mr. Howard, Mr. Anderson, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this excellent uh, conference. The year 1997 marked the start of a difficult decade for the National Party, even though for all of that time it was a partner in government with the Liberals and its leaders enjoyed a strong working relationship with the Prime Minister, John Howard. Philosophically, the parties, and particularly their leaders, were aligned on the major priorities of budget repair, industrial relations and tax reform, stopping illegal boat arrivals, and foreign trade and defence policy issues. Moreover, the National Party could identify some significant achievements during the period under discussion, including major new spending on rural health roads, regional, regional development and drought funding, uh, agriculture advancing Australia, at the time the biggest symbol, single ever uh, program ever introduced for the nation's farm industries, retention of the diesel fuel excise rebate, export market development grants and the analogue mobile phone network beyond its scheduled shutdown date, changes to the WIC native title plan to ease concerns about the tenure of pastoral land, a commitment to build the Alice Springs to Darwin Railway, very close to the heart of Tim Fisher, and establishing Australia's first philanthropic foundation to help country communities, namely the Foundation for Rural and Regional Renewal. Despite all of this, and having come out of the 1996 election with 18 members in the House of Representatives, the National Party's numbers progressively declined over the next four elections to a meagre 10 after 2007. And that was an all-time low of just 6.7% of seats in the House of Representatives. Which begs, begs the question, if the party was being successful, why was its representation falling? The answers begin with perception. Historically, there have been suspicions, generally mis misguided, among rank and file members that their parliamentarians are too willing to go along with liberal policies. This was exacerbated in the Howard era by the National Party's move away from interventionist ideals. Now add two new factors, gun laws and Pauline Hanson. The post Port Arthur tightening of gun laws seriously hurt the National Party. Members resigned and the federal leader and deputy time, Prime Minister Tim Fisher was widely criticised, notably in Queensland, for going along with what was seen as a Howard policy, even though he was a very firm supporter of the policy. Hanson, who formed One Nation in April 1997, seemed to offer some alternative. She gained sustained publicity for her positions against multiculturalism, Aboriginal land rights, Asian immigration, deregulation, rationalisation, privatisation, trade liberalisation and the tougher gun laws. To many National Party supporters, she was filling a policy void that had been created by none other than the National Party itself. Paradoxically, it is possible to add John Howard to the mix. He was a powerful leader, not just of the Liberal Party, but also of the Coalition, demanding discipline and loyalty, especially from his cabinet and ministry. He was widely respected, including in the bush, despite apprehension about some liberal directions. Moreover, he was sympathetic to the needs of the bush, to the point where, as John Anderson has acknowledged, if he thought something the nationals were asking for was half right, he'd go out of his way to help them to achieve it. Most of all, John Howard was identified absolutely as a liberal. Therefore, when he declared, as he frequently did, that my government or the Howard government is doing this or that, unwittingly or otherwise, he sidelined the National Party's involvement in the government. Now, he wasn't the first Prime Minister and he won't be the last to use such terminology, but his strong standing in the community despite Labor's efforts to denigrate him as little Johnny Howard, made it particularly powerful. Now this is not to say that Fisher, Anderson or other national ministers were not promoting policies and outcomes. They were, 
and in so doing, they were being loyal to Howard and to the philosophy of cooperative coalition. They were promoting the government. Now, the National Party's image was not helped by the resignation of two ministers, John Sharp and Peter McGoran, in September 1997 over breaches of Howard's strict ministerial code of conduct. McGoran was later reinstated to the ministry, but John Sharp was so gutted that he retired at the October 1998 election, a decision which created a bitter three-corner contest, won by the Liberals, in his seat of Hume, and which caused something of a leadership hiatus within the National Party, which I'll come to shortly. Alarm bells went off when One Nation won 11 seats, five of them from the National Party, at the June 1998 Queensland state election. Howard was determined that at the federal election, held on the 3rd of October 1998, Liberal candidates would put One Nation last on their Howder votes. Fisher wanted the same for the National Party candidates. He and John Anderson went so far as to declare their positions vacant at a party meeting on the 3rd of August. They were re-elected unopposed, enabling them to argue to the state organisations that the parliamentary party supported the One Nation last position. There was no directive that candidates must do this, and five of the 32 lower house candidates, two in New South Wales and three incumbent members in Queensland, refused to do, uh, refused to do so. The One Nation last position caused considerable resentment within the broader Nationals membership. Many believed One Nation was more reflective excuse me, was more reflective of National Party views than was the National Party, and that in any event, it was nothing like the political enemy of the Nationals as were the Greens, the Democratic Socialist League, and citizens' electoral councils. Nonetheless, the strategy arguably worked, because despite losing two lower house seats and two senators, which is heavy enough casualty for a small party, the National Party nonetheless survived the election better than many had feared. There were, however, some whopping swings that they suffered in heartland seats, more than 26% against Warren Truss in Wide Bay and 21% against John Anderson in Guida. Now, those sort of figures don't bode too well for the, the uh, uh, next election down the track. For now, however, the government was returned and could concentrate on implementing the GST the main economic issue of the election campaign, progressing the gradual sale of Telstra and planning for the November 1999 Republic referendum. Selling the GST was not as difficult as dealing with Telstra. Tim Fisher had worked hard in 1990 and 91 to blunt state party concerns over the GST that was envisaged in John Hewson's fight back program. Now he could point to benefits for export industries small businesses and heavy road and rail transport operators. Where problems arose in the rollout of the GST, the National Party was influential in finding solutions, notably the need for a further downward adjustment to fuel excise, easing the complexity of the new business activity statements and offsetting the impact of GST on caravan park owners. Larry Anthony agitated hard on the last issue to the point of almost being sacked from the ministry, and the solution undoubtedly saved his seat of Richmond, uh, where some 6,000 people lived in caravan parks at the 2001 election. Telstra was a different story. Uh, the government sold one-third in 1997 without much controversy, as it still held majority ownership. But when Howard announced in March 1998 that the government's remaining shareholding would be sold, there was an outcry across the bush, with complaints that a privatised Telstra would increasingly ignore its needs. Due in no small part to the National Party, the government guaranteed not to relinquish majority control until an independent inquiry certified that Telstra met prescribed service standards. It sold a further 16% towards the end of 1999, leaving it with 51% ownership. Now, the National Party achieved very substantial gains for regional Australia through the two Telstra sales, a variety of programs worth nearly $1.6 billion, in spite of Treasurer Peter Costello's wish that sale revenues go towards reducing debt. 
and more would come uh, as the government worked towards selling its final shareholding in 2005. On the Republic referendum, there was no blanket yes or no position taken by the National Party, although the New South Wales Party's Central Council did vote to support the no campaign, and not an insignificant number of party members in the state of New South Wales uh, helped with that campaign. There was no improvement in the electorate's antipathy towards the party, however. It was being criticised for supporting deregulation of the dairy industry, while One Nation was opposed to it, as was the member for Ken uh, Kennedy, Bob Catter, who quit the National Party in July 2001 to become an independent. Overlooked was the fact that the Nationals secured close to $2 billion to help the dairy industry adjust. So was the party underperforming? The answer is demonstrably no. Was it being overshadowed or undersold? Well, probably both. And this has long been a problem for the smaller party in coalition, and finding answers has always been easier said than done. If anything, it has become more difficult in modern times, with media scrutiny of politics heavily focused on what the Prime Minister and the opposition leader say and do. Under coalition agreements, members of both parties are obliged to support and advocate coalition policies. This is no more restrictive on the nationals than it is on the Liberals. But after close to 70 years in almost continued coalition, the word coalition to many people become, becomes more synonymous with Liberal than anything else. So the nationals have to work hard to maintain their identity. But boasting about rolling a Liberal idea or about policy wins in Cabinet would not only paint a picture of disunity, but also potentially breach the spirit of coalition and even of cabinet solidarity. And further tensions would be created. Many Liberals get twitchy if they sense the Nats are getting too much or appearing to wield more influence than their numbers should justify. So in speeches to party conferences, leaders highlighted government or coalition programs rather than say that had it not been for the National Party in cabinet, this would never have happened or without the Nationals in Cabinet, you would have lost X or Y. Highlighting the undersold aspect, the then Federal President and New South Wales Party Chairman, Helen Dickey, told the State Party Annual Conference at Tweed Heads in June 2000 that the Nationals should stop using the word coalition, declaring we must highlight National Party achievements, not make coalition announcements. Anderson, by then Federal Leader and Deputy Prime Minister, replied that he would not stop using the C word and that he didn't feel any need to be defensive about the party's identity or performance. Interestingly, he changed his tune three years later, saying that the party had been too content to talk about government achievements rather than what it had achieved. There is another point. While John Howard was a strong coalitionist, he was not averse to making announcements that arguably should have been made by National Party ministers. He announced agriculture advancing Australia, albeit at a joint news conference with John Anderson, and he announced the Alice Springs to Darwin Railway commitment and the establishment of the Foundation for Rural and Regional Renewal. And in a, and, and in a further point too, beyond this overshadowing, some Liberal Party organisations still harbour ambitions to amalgamate or chip away at the National Party in three-cornered contests where, where possible. And the loss to the Liberals of Murray in 1996, of Hume in 1998, and of Tim Fisher's seat of Farrah on his retirement in 2001 are examples. There is, of course, a bit of tit for tat here because the Nats won Murray back at the last federal election. <laughs> so it's healthy competition. As well as political and electoral challenges, the National Party faced an enormous internal problem in the early years of the, of the, uh, of the Howard government, money. In 1994, the federal organisation took out a mortgage of just over $3 million to redevelop its secretariat building John McEwen House here in Canberra. The new building was opened in November 1996. An unforeseen circumstance 
was that the new government wanted Commonwealth departments seeking office accommodation to find it in Commonwealth-owned buildings rather than commercial ones, and especially ones owned by political organisations. The impact on the National Party's finances was immediate and enormous. Most of John McEwen House remained unleased throughout 1997, and from the beginning of 1998 until the end of 2000, the position of Federal Director was filled in an honorary capacity. The situation prompted Anderson to pursue a plan whereby the state parties would reimburse to the federal organisation a greater percentage of their public funding uh, of, the, of their public funding from Commonwealth elections than had previously been the case, and he achieved this with grudging agreement from the states during the course of 2001. Now I mentioned that John Sharp's retirement caused consternation within the parliamentary leadership. This was because both Tim Fisher and John Anderson wanted to retire for personal and family reasons, and they both saw John Sharp as the leadership successor. He had been an impressive transport and regional development minister, working among other things closely with industrial relations minister Peter Reith on waterfront reform. His departure meant Fisher remained leader until handing over to Anderson in July 1999, and Anderson in turn stayed until passing the job to Mark Vale in June 2005. So what are future issues for the National Party? The party is almost 100 years old. It has proven ability to adjust to change, but how might contemporary developments play on its future? Is regional Queensland better served now by the single LNP formed in July 2008 than it was under the previous state coalition? And could the answers to that question be applied federally? What if, over, say, the next 10 years, LNP federal parliamentarians see themselves simply as LNP rather than liberal or national, as is currently the case, and decide to sit as a party in their own right? What will that mean for coalition negotiations? And importantly, what will that mean for the National Party? And how dangerous to the National Party are the likes of One Nation, Shooters, Farmers and Fish, uh, Shooters Fishers and Farmers, and Australian Conservatives? Another issue, that is, uh, another issue is that of decreasing numbers, yet increasing sizes of remote electorates. National Party parliamentarians generally shy away from this subject, fearful of being portrayed as gerrymanderists. Yet it is a matter that should generate bipartisan interest. There are currently 10 federal electorates in excess of 100,000 square kilometres. There's 14 in excess of 50,000 square kilometres. But only three of those 10 are held by the National Party. The largest Commonwealth electorate is Durack in Western Australia, a staggering 1.63 million square kilometres. There is no way a Member of Parliament can satisfactorily represent an area of 50 or 100,000 square kilometres, let alone more than a million, especially when you understand that the smallest electorate, Graindler in Sydney, covers just 32 square kilometres. Surely this is an area that deserves renewed attention. And with those questions and queries in your minds, ladies and gentlemen, I say thank you very much. Paul, can I ponder one solution? If the Office of Deputy Prime Minister were augmented or had its own portfolio, something like that, would that help, do you think, to give the Nationals a feel that their leader has a standing other than they will stand in for the Prime Minister when the Prime Minister is absent. Would that help? That's an interesting question, uh, Professor. I, I, and, and I confess it's a question that I haven't uh, considered uh, deeply at all. My, my immediate response to that is that I don't think so because, I, frankly, I think the National Party is very satis satisfied with the fact that in a coalition government arrangements, its leader is the Deputy Prime Minister. and. Um, uh, generally able to, um, uh, in discussion with the Prime Minister, to take on the portfolio of his choice. And would there be a push for the National Party to resume the Treasury? So go back to Arthur Fadden's time. 
I don't think so. Um, certainly, that the uh, Liberals wouldn't allow it, or the Nationals? No, no, no. I frankly don't think the National Party would want it. <laughs> I, th I think I think we'd uh, we, we'd we preferred to uh, we prefer to trade. For instance, um, you know, if that sort of issue came up, we'd be more likely, I think, to go to, in the negotiations to say, look, you guys, you guys, hang on to Treasury. You're very welcome to Treasury, but just give us back trade. Uh, <laughs> the um, the the Treasury ship holding by the um, country party as it then was, of course, was established by Earl Page and, 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 and then pursued uh, by Arthur Fadden that sort of set that trend, if you like, that the country party was the natural party for the Treasury. But since Arthur Fadden's time, uh, I, I think things have moved on quite considerably. Thank you. Questions? One question. Just wait for the microphone. Your name? <laughs> Uh, Paul, Troy Reeves, um, I worked for Warren Trust uh, in the lead up to the 2001 election and um, can certainly confirm that uh, CEC uh, took up a lot of our time with their conspiracy theories and that um, guns were still a massive issue even then, five years afterwards, and particularly after 9-11, uh, the attitude was, we're at war and you've taken our guns off us. Um, but or from us. From us, yeah. Um, what I wanted to ask, uh, Paul Neville was obviously our neighbour and it took him uh, two weeks to find out his result. It came right down to the wire. It was said then, and it's been said since, that only a national and not a liberal could hold um, sort of ultra marginal seats like that. I've never heard an explanation of why, but I'd be interested to know if you can expand on that. <laughs> I'm not sure that I can too much. Uh, um, certainly, Rural seats, um, regional seats, the local member of parliament is far better known than possibly they are in, in, in city electorates. Um, national party uh, members of parliament spend an enormous amount of time in their electorates and they do an enormous amount of work in their electorates. I'm not suggesting for a moment that Liberal Party members don't either. But in the rural regional areas, because they're going around to all these little bun fights and little meetings and all the rest of it, um, they get known a lot better. That might help in terms of the tenure um, of the seat. The, um, now, in terms of uh, uh, Paul Neville's situation, yes, I'm, he's, he went down to the wire on more than one occasion, I know that much, and uh, he was a very tenacious uh, local member and successfully hang on to, hung on to them, yeah. Had the seat been a Liberal Party seat, or put it the other way around. Had Paul Neville been a Liberal, well, I suspect, the, I suspect the result would have been the same for him. I'd like to think so. Thanks for the question. Anne. Uh, thanks, Paul, very much for a really interesting presentation. Um, I can't let the Queensland LNP question go <laughs> without inviting um, a bit further uh, input on that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of experience going this time, Lawrence Springborg's leaving, Jeff Seney, some big figures in the party up there. What, what, are, you, what are your um, concerns for the LNP in the longer run? And what do you think, I mean, do you imagine that issue that you raised of sole identification and the, you know, I guess de-identification with the traditional parties of the coalition, uh, do you see that spreading beyond Queensland? Look, I think the, um as I say, the LNP, the LNP has passed the initial test of time. Um, when it was formed, July 2008, I mean, we're getting close to a decade ago now. Um, oh, there was a lot of people who said, oh, you know, this, this ain't going to last. Uh, Queensland had a coalition in the late 20s, early 30s, um, which I think served a term in government too. Um, and it blew apart. So a lot of people saying, oh yes, you know, they've done this in Queensland before, but uh, it's all right, well, the status quo will revert, we'll revert back to the status quo. Um, a bit easier said than done, though, because the National Party uh, um, put a very substantial financial stake into the, uh, into the amalgamation. Um, what, so having settled down, I mean, there's a, I, I guess there's still always the prospect that it might blow up at some point and you might get, go revert back to two parties. That's, that's, one, that's one course. The other course is that it continues to solidify as a single political party. And the natural extension of that is that over a course of time, um, 
party members won't see themselves as, oh yeah, I'm in the LNP, but I'm really a Nat, or, or I'm really a Lib. All of that will dissolve and float away, and the party will be the LNP. And once it reaches that point, then, uh, I, and, and I, you know, it could very easily reach that point, then I, I see that uh, federally, um, you know, its, its members will be told, well, you're going to sit as the LNP, you got your, you have your own party room. Assuming they've got enough members, which they will have, you know, yeah. So it's, it's possible. I, I mean, it's, it's hypothetical, of course, but uh, I think it's possible. Well, I, I don't see any other course. It's, it's either collapse or consolidate, and in consolidation, become totally an independent third, uh, you know, in further freestanding party. Any other questions? Well then please join with me in thanking Paul for the next <laughs>